Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today, we'll take a quick look at a real-world capacitor charge and discharge circuit. We'll see if cold hard reality matches our theoretical expectations. This demonstration operates under the presumption the viewer is intimately familiar with both the capacitor charge and capacitor discharge process. Additionally, it's presumed the viewer has a degree of mathematical competency, could determine electrical properties at specific times, and solve for times that satisfy specific conditions. Our circuit of interest consists of an 18 volt DC source, a super large 6,500 microfarad capacitor, and a knife switch that toggles between two resistors. In position one, the switch serves to charge the capacitor through R1, a one kilo ohm resistor, and in position two, the switch serves to discharge the capacitor through R2, also a one kilo ohm resistor. The capacitor is initially uncharged and exhibits no voltage differential across it. Instrumentation is configured in the following fashion. Voltmeter 1 measures voltage across R1, positive to negative, left to right. Ammeter 1 measures current through R1, in to out, left to right. Voltmeter C measures voltage across the capacitor, positive to negative, top to bottom. Ammeter C measures current through the capacitor, in to out, top to bottom. Voltmeter 2 measures voltage across R2, positive to negative, left to right. And finally, ammeter 2 measures current through R2, in to out, left to right. Here's the real world setup we'll be using today. All six DMMs will allow us the luxury of watching this charge and discharge process unfold in real time. Let's examine the capacitor charge process first. Step zero, do the calculations first. Let's see if our observations match our expectations. First, see if you can calculate the time constant for the capacitor charging process. Then determine the initial conditions for elements in this system. Finally, determine the final steady state conditions for elements in the system after a full charge of five time constants. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have arrived at the following values. The time constant for the charge circuit is the resistance value of R1 times the capacitance value. Substituting in the given values of one kilo ohm and 6,500 microfarads, we obtain a time constant of 6.5 seconds. This is a super large time constant for two important reasons. One, R1 presents a fairly large resistance value at one kilo ohm. And two, most importantly, the capacitor is astrophrickingnomically huge. 6,500 microfarads. That's like a super tanker for charge storage compared to the little peapod capacitors you might be used to using in lab. A complete charge will occur after a time span of five time constants, or five times 6.5 seconds, or 32.5 seconds. Conveniently, this large time constant will allow us to see the charge process unfold in real time without the use of special purpose instrumentation. Additionally, by recording the charge process, we'll be capable of pausing the demonstration whenever we desire to take a look at instantaneous values at specific times. At the onset of the charge process, the initially uncharged capacitor can be modeled as a short circuit. Voltage across R1 will be 18 volts, and voltage across the initially uncharged capacitor will be 0 volts. Ohm's law demonstrates R1, and every element in series with it will experience an initial burst of 18 volts over 1000 ohms, or 18 milliampers of current. Given the switch in position 1 isolates R2, no current will flow through it and no voltage will be dropped across it. These are the start points for the charge process. After 5 time constants or 32.5 seconds, the fully charged capacitor can be modeled as an open circuit. At t equals 32.5 seconds, current through both R1 and the capacitor will have ceased and 18 volts will be dropped across the fully charged capacitor. At the end of the charge process, both I1 and IC will be equal to 0 amps, V1 will be 0 volts and VC will be 18 volts. These are the endpoints for the charge process. We have the start points, the endpoints, and the time constant. See if you can derive the time variant expressions for current through R1 as a function of time, I1 of t, voltage across R1 as a function of time, V1 of t, current through the capacitor as a function of time, IC of t, and voltage across the capacitor as a function of time, VC of t. I wouldn't worry about deriving expressions for R2 since it's effectively isolated during the charge process. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have arrived at the following values. I1 of t equals 18 milliampers times e to the negative t over 6.5 seconds. Current through R1 will experience an initial surge of 18 milliampers and drop to zero over 32.5 seconds. V1 of t equals 18 volts times e to the negative t over 6.5 seconds. Voltage across R1 will surge to 18 volts and drop to zero by 32.5 seconds. Given this is a series circuit, IC of t also equals 18 milliampers times e to the negative t over 6.5 seconds. Current through the capacitor will experience an initial surge of 18 milliampers and drop to zero over 32.5 seconds. 
Find the VC of T equals 18 volts times 1 minus E to the negative T over 6.5 seconds. Voltage across the capacitor will start at 0 volts and rise to 18 volts by 32.5 seconds. Now that we've got the time bearing expressions, let's try some instantaneous analysis. See if you can determine the instantaneous values of current and voltage for all elements involved in the charge process at time t equals 5 seconds, just a little bit before one time constant. Additionally, see if you can determine the time value when the capacitor is charged up to 12 volts. Once you've solved for this moment in time, determine the instantaneous values for the remaining properties at this same time. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have arrived at the following values. Substituting 5 seconds into our time bearing expression for voltage across the capacitor demonstrates the capacitor will have charged up to roughly 9.7 volts 5 seconds into the charge process. An application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates that R1 experiences a remaining 18 minus 9.7, or roughly 8.3 volt drop. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates R1 will experience 8.3 milliamps of current, as will the capacitor. For our second set, Algebraic manipulation demonstrates the capacitor will have charged up to 12 volts by roughly 7.1 seconds. At this same moment in time, an application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates R1 experiences the remaining 18 minus 12, or 6 volt drop. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates R1 will experience 6 milliampers of current, as will the capacitor. There you have it. Not only have we modeled a complete charge process, we know the instantaneous values of electrical properties at specific times. Let's see if cold hard reality meets these expectations to a reasonable degree of accuracy. I'll let the charge process run through once with some minimal commentary and then go through it again, stopping at specific points along the way. The moment the knife switch is moved to position 1 at t equals 0, we start the charge process. Current through R1 and into the capacitor experiences an initial spike, which then starts to subside. Voltage across the charging capacitor rises. As current tapers off, Voltage across R1 also drops. After 32-ish seconds, voltage across the capacitor stops at roughly 18 volts. Current through the charge circuit also stops. This ends the complete charge process. Looks good so far. Let's see if it passes close inspection. Let's start the charging process again and pause it along the way for some thrilling play-by-play -play commentary. This time we'll zoom in on the meters for the elements in the charge circuit, notably R1 and the capacitor. The moment the knife switch is moved to position 1 at t equals 0, we start the charge process. The initially uncharged capacitor starts the charge process at 0 volts. Current through R1 and into the initially uncharged capacitor spikes to roughly 18 milliampers. Five or so seconds into the charge process, it looks like voltage across the charging capacitor has risen to roughly 9.6-ish volts. This is super close to our anticipated value of 9.7 volts. When voltage across the charging capacitor has risen to roughly 12 volts, 2.1 or so seconds later, T equals roughly 7.1 seconds, current through R1 and into the initially charging capacitor has continued to drop to roughly 6.3 milliampers. This is super close to our anticipated value of 6 milliampers. Voltage across R1 has dropped to roughly 6.2 volts. This is again super close to our anticipated value of 6 volts. The rest of the charge process slowly unfolds and the capacitor eventually reaches a final voltage of roughly 18 volts current through the charge process ceases altogether at roughly 32 and a half seconds. This is exactly what we anticipated. Moving on, let's now examine a complete discharge. Let's skip the handholding and see if you can model a complete discharge by yourself with the knowledge that the discharge begins with the capacitor having a starting voltage of 18 volts, positive to negative, top to bottom. Let's assume the discharge process begins at some other t equals zero, at which point the knife switch is toggled to position two. It is far easier to assume another t equals zero and simply cut and paste the subsequent discharge onto our previous analysis of the complete charge than it is to incorporate a 32 and a half second offset into the discharge equations. If you want a task list, here it is. First, see if you can solve for the time constant associated with the discharge process when the 6,500 microfarad capacitor is discharged through R2, also a one kilo ohm resistor. Next, determine the initial values at the start of the discharge process for voltage across the capacitor current through the capacitor, 
voltage across R2 and current through R2. Don't worry about the electrical properties for R1 during the discharge process since the knife switch in position 2 isolates R1. Then determine the final values at the end of the discharge process for voltage across the capacitor, current through the capacitor, voltage across R2 and current through R2 after a full discharge of 5 time constants. Then see if you can determine the time variant expressions for voltage across the capacitor, current through the capacitor, voltage across R2 and current through R2 during the discharge process. Again, to make your job easy, my advice would be to simply assume the discharge starts at another t equals zero. This method sure beats including a 32 and a half second offset into each and every equation. Given these time variant expressions, see if you can determine the instantaneous values for voltage across the capacitor, current through the capacitor, voltage across R2 and current through R2 three seconds into the discharge process. Finally, see if you can determine the time voltage across the discharging capacitor will have dropped to five volts. At this same moment in time, determine the instantaneous values for current through the capacitor, voltage across R2, and current through R2. Now before you go off marching into the Blackberries with this task list in hand, I need to remind you that orientation of instrumentation in the circuit remains as illustrated. If current flow reverses direction during the discharge process, hint hint, one might anticipate certain properties to experience negative values. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following data. Substituting in our given values for R2 in the capacitor, we find the time constant for the discharge process to also be 6.5 seconds. As previously, this should give us plenty of time to watch the process unfold in real time. A complete discharge should take 5 times 6.5 seconds, or 32.5 seconds. The initial voltage across the capacitor at the onset of the discharge is that value obtained during the previous charge, in this case, 18 volts. Given there are only two elements in this discharge path, R2 also experiences an initial differential of 18 volts. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that R2 will experience an initial surge of approximately 18 milliamperes. The discharging capacitor must therefore be supplying 18 milliamperes at the onset of the discharge. Current is coming out of the discharging capacitor rather than into it. To account for this reversal of current, the instantaneous value of current through the capacitor is going to be considered negative. These are the start points for the discharge process. If we let the discharge process unfold for a full 5 time constants or 32 and a half seconds, we'd expect voltage across each element to drop to 0 volts and discharge current to cease. These are the endpoints for the discharge process. We have the start points, the endpoints, and the time constant. Current through the capacitor IC of t can be expressed as negative 18 milliamperes times e to the negative t over 6.5 seconds where 18 milliamperes is the magnitude of the initial discharge current surge and the negative sign indicates current is leaving the discharging capacitor. Current out of the capacitor will spike to negative 18 milliamperes and drop to zero by 32.5 seconds. Voltage across the capacitor as a function of time Vc of t can be expressed as 18 volts times e to the negative t over 6.5 seconds. Voltage across the discharging capacitor will start at the previously obtained value of 18 volts and drop to zero volts by 32.5 seconds. Current through R2, IR2 of T can be expressed as 18 milliamperes times e to the negative T over 6.5 seconds, where the positive sign indicates current is entering R2 and out left to right. Current through R2 will spike to 18 milliamperes and drop to zero by 32.5 seconds. Finally, voltage across R2 as a function of time, VR2 of T can also be expressed as 18 volts times e to the negative T over 6.5 seconds. Voltage across R2 will start at 18 volts and drop to zero volts by 32.5 seconds. Given these time variant expressions, we can now solve for instantaneous values at specific times and solve for time values that yield specific conditions. Three seconds into the discharge process, the time variant expression for voltage across the capacitor demonstrates the capacitor will have discharged to roughly 11.3 volts. An application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates that R2 also experiences an 11.3 volt drop. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates R2 will experience 11.3 milliampers of current. This means 3 seconds into the discharge process, the capacitor must be supplying 11.3 milliampers of current, or negative 11.3 milliampers, when the negative sign indicates reversal. Current is leaving the discharging capacitor and entering R2. We can also use these time variant expressions to solve for time values that satisfy specific conditions. We have been tasked to determine the time it takes to discharge the capacitor down to 5 volts.
algebraic manipulation of the voltage across the capacitor as a function of time equation demonstrates the capacitor will have discharged down to 5 volts by roughly 8.3 seconds. At this same moment in time, an application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates that R2 will also experience a 5 volt drop. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates R2 will experience 5 milliampers of current. This means 8.3 seconds into the discharge process, the capacitor will be supplying 5 milliampers of current, or negative 5 milliampers, where the negative sign indicates reversal. There you have it. Not only have we modeled a complete discharge process, we know the instantaneous values of electrical properties at specific times. Let's see if cold hard reality meets these expectations to a reasonable degree of accuracy. I'll let the discharge process run through once with some minimal commentary and then go through it again stopping at specific points along the way. The moment the knife switch is moved to position 2 at another t equals 0, we start the discharge process. Current through R2 and out of the capacitor experiences an initial spike which then starts to subside. Note the negative sign for the capacitor current indicates reversal, i.e. current is coming out of the discharging capacitor. Voltage across the discharging capacitor drops. As current tapers off, voltage across R2 also drops. After 32-ish seconds, voltage across the discharging capacitor and R2 effectively flatlines at roughly zero volts. Current through the discharge circuit grinds to a halt. This ends the complete discharge process. Looks good so far. Let's see if it passes close inspection. Let's start the discharge process again and pause it along the way for some thrilling play-by-play -play commentary. The moment the knife switch is moved to position 2 at another t equals 0, we start the discharge process. The fully charged capacitor starts the discharge process at 18 volts, as does R2. Current through R2 and out of the discharging capacitor spikes to roughly 18 milliampers, where current leaving the capacitor is accounted for by use of a negative sign. The meters display what we anticipated to a reasonable degree of accuracy. Three seconds into the discharge process, it looks like voltage across the discharging capacitor in R2 has dropped to 11.8 volts and 11.6 volts. This is super close to our anticipated value of 11.3 volts. After the initial spike, current out of the discharging capacitor and through R2 has dropped to respectively negative 12 and 11.8 milliampers, where current leaving the capacitor is accounted for by use of a negative sign. This is super close to our anticipated value of 11.3 milliampers. When voltage across the discharging capacitor has dropped to 5 volts, roughly 5.3 seconds later, 8.3 seconds into the discharge process, looks like current through R2 and out of the discharging capacitor has dropped to 5.1 milliampers, where current leaving the capacitor is accounted for by use of a negative sign. This is super close to our anticipated value of 5 milliampers. The rest of the discharge process slowly unfolds until voltage across the capacitor in R2 flatlines at 0 volts after a full 32.5 second discharge. At the same time voltage drops to 0 volts, current through the discharge circuit ceases altogether. This is exactly what we anticipated. If we were to replay and pause the video of the charge and discharge process at regular intervals and then plot the experimentally obtained instantaneous values, we'd obtain plots that look something like this. During the charging process, Current rushes through R2 and into the capacitor. While charging, voltage across the capacitor rises. During the discharge process, current rushes out of the capacitor and through R2. While discharging, voltage across the capacitor drops. Any voltage experienced by any resistor is simply a consequence of the incoming and outgoing current experienced by the capacitor during the charge or discharge process. Importantly, voltage across the capacitor whether charging or discharging, never undergoes a disjointed instantaneous transition or a sudden reversal in polarity. That's the point. Capacitors resist sudden changes in voltage and are often employed in circuits that necessitate relatively steady or slowly changing voltage conditions. In summary, our observations matched our expectations to a reasonable degree of accuracy and all is well and good in the world. I want you to put your hand on top of the internet and repeat after me. I, state your name, do hereby believe it is within my capacity to model a real-world capacitor charge and discharge process using the circuit analysis skills thus far presented. In summary, imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. <laughs>
Hope you enjoyed this practical demonstration of the capacitive charge and discharge process as much as I did and managed to learn something along the way. 